In this lecture, we'll look at becoming part of the process of bringing your food to your fork. Eating is an agricultural act, and in this, we're all farmers. Some of us are just doing our harvesting at the supermarket. Sustainability is about making the transition from being a passive consumer to being an active co-producer of your food and other essential elements of your life. This transition involves learning about new gardening philosophies with new terms like eco-gastronomy. These new philosophies are behind new social movements like the slow food movement and growing food at home, whether home has space for an in-the-ground garden or plants in containers. I'll talk about simple methods of growing something fresh for your table 365 days a year, even if you live in an apartment in the city. I'll show you interesting ways to mimic nature to start productive gardens that require only a few hours of enjoyable labor per week to establish and maintain. We can't cover all the details of growing your own food in this course. For more detail, check out other great courses that cover gardening. First, let's talk about eating. Food is always better when it's fresh and local. The pleasure of eating is a basic human right. And Carlo Petrini, founder of Slow Food, says gastronomy is the other half of sustainable agriculture. I love Slow Food's approach to sustainability, environmental activism, and eating. The Slow Food movement goes about its work from, enhancing, from the angle of enhancing pleasure, sensuality, and community by advocating for food systems that are good, clean, and fair. What do I mean by good, clean, and fair? Well, good, food should taste good or what's the point? Clean, food should be free of poisons and shouldn't pollute the earth through its production. And fair, the producer should earn a living wage and its cost should be affordable. Pleasure at the table shouldn't be reserved for just the wealthy. Petrini describes eco-gastronomy and contrasts it with a more conventional understanding of gastronomy with the following quote. I am a gastronome. I like to know the history of a food and of the place that it comes from. I like to imagine the hands of the people who grew it, transported it, processed it, and cooked it before it was served to me. I do not want the food I consume to deprive others in the world of food. I like traditional farmers, the relationship they have with the earth, and the way they appreciate what is good. The good belongs to everyone. Pleasure belongs to everyone, for it is human nature. This is from Carlo Petrini's book, Slow Food Nation. Pleasure at the table as a basic human right demonstrates a new approach to sustainability. Eco-gastronomy and sustainable gardening are examples of how living more sustainably, again, means a richer life, not a diminished one. The fact that agriculture is one of the most destructive forces on the planet, yet is primary in sustaining human life, is a central paradox of modern life. It's why so much attention is placed on sustainable agriculture. But it can be confusing trying to sort through all the claims made about the food we eat. Here's a way of understanding the differences between those claims about food. I've adapted this from Elliot Coleman, an author and one of America's best small farmers. Locally grown organic food is like listening to great musicians perform live music in an intimate, informal setting. Cafe Paradiso is a small cafe in my hometown that seats just a few dozen people. I've had the opportunity to sit right next to world-class musicians at the cafe while they are performing. No microphones, nothing between me and these pure sounds. And I could practically nourish myself on it. That's locally grown organic food. If I listen to the same performer in a large concert hall through a sound system, that's California organic food that's been shipped in. If I listen to that same performer on a disc or MP3, that's canned or frozen food. And finally, if I hear that same performer playing the same music on a car radio with a fading station, that's fast food. Food isn't all the same, and the best stuff is grown at home. So how can you find time to become more involved in the food you eat? Remember, not long ago, email and the internet didn't exist. Yet we've all found plenty of time to devote to that. Our lives change as our worldviews and our priorities shift. You can start small and even just getting to know someone who produces your food, maybe one of the regulars at a local farmer's market near you, just that starts to make you part of the cycle. So let's discuss this idea of getting more involved with your food. Wanna grow some of it? It's one of the most satisfying activities that I have ever been engaged in. You learn firsthand about sustainability by engaging, even in a small way, in the cycles needed to produce some of your own food. 
Farmer Elliot Coleman argues that getting involved in growing some of your own food is like raising your children or developing main and maintaining friendships, an essential human activity that you can't satisfactorily hire someone else to do for you. When I first started to grow my own food, I got all excited and wrapped up in the idea of a big garden with the goal of growing all my food. What I discovered is I didn't know what to do with a big garden. It was in an out-of-the-way location, so I had to make special visits to work on it. I didn't know how to manage the inevitable weed and pest problems that developed. It, I didn't have an easy way to water it during dry times. It became a drudgery, and before the season was over, I abandoned it. I still got a yield, but it was way out of scale with the work involved. One of the most important decisions you will make about growing food is what scale to start with. It's always better to start small and get a satisfying yield. This is another principle of ecological design. Start small and build on success. You can expand as your skill and confidence develop. Have a goal that you eat something that you grow every day. This might mean just a sprig of parsley for your soup or a handful of sprouts. What you grow should be located in a place you pass by several times a day, so it's in the flow of what you do and not something that requires a lot of extra effort. The ability to regularly observe what is going on in your mini farm is important to the pleasure you get and the overall success of the project. There's an old proverb that says the best fertilizer is the footprint of the farmer. This illustrates yet another principle of ecological design. Place design elements that require more attention in areas visited most often. So place your garden where you'll pass it by, maybe near the front door of your home or the door near your kitchen. There are many different gardening philosophies with strong adherence and good results. I'll discuss a couple of them next, and then I'll show you a unique method of low work gardening based on what's called sheet mulching. The first philosophy I'll talk about is one developed by John Jevons and his colleagues at Ecology Action. They have spent 40 years developing an elegant, small-scale farming and gardening system called Grow Biointensive. When practiced correctly, it nurtures healthy soil, produces high yields, and conserves resources. Gardeners and small farmers have used it worldwide. And check out Jevons' book with the long title, How to Grow More Vegetables Than You Ever Thought Possible on Less Land Than You Can Imagine. His methods derive in part from the intensive market gardens that developed around Paris in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. Growing with the biointensive method requires a lot of work up front, digging to a depth of 12 inches and loosening the soil another foot. Digging two feet down, depending on the nature of your soil, is a lot of work. Might be a good idea to team up with a friend or neighbor, share the work, then share the yield. But the results are impressive, and it can all be done without power tools. Beds are typically five by 20 feet, and he has worked out the best plant spacing to maximize the amount of food you can grow on a given space. Jevons' method includes growing the compost crops you need to maintain the fertility of the soil food web as well as the food crops you eat. The soil food web is the comp complex relationship that plants have with the life in the soil. Compost feeds the life in the soil, and the life in the soil feeds the plants. Compost is made from decomposing plant matter, and if you don't grow something to make compost, you'll have to bring it in from outside. Jevons' method grows a lot of food on a small space. A full vegan diet for a person for a year, including compost crops, can be grown on about 4,000 square feet. In contrast, the average U.S. diet takes about 28,000 square feet. Another popular gardening philosophy and method is square foot gardening explained in a series of books by Mel Bartholomew. But my favorite gardening books are those by Elliot Coleman. They are a pleasure to read and take a simple, no-nonsense approach to organic, sustainable gardening. In his book, Four Season Harvest, he details his breakthrough methods for growing in what is normally considered the off-season, fall and winter. We'll talk more about this in the next lecture. He gardens in beds that are 30 inches wide, takes an approach that involves feeding the soil, not the plants, and focuses on plant health to minimize disease and insect problems. So let's talk about how you can get started with a small, low-effort garden. Many of you, no doubt, have a lawn with a lot of grass in it. Establishing a garden on what was previously lawn can be a lot of work. Here's a way to establish a garden in a couple of hours of easy work without pulling up the grass or digging. With this method of gardening, you may not have to water or weed for the entire season. It's called sheet mulching, mulch gardening, or no-till. 
It's also been called lasagna gardening because the bed is built in layers like a lasagna. Compared to conventionally tilled gardens, it's better for the life in the soil. That's because different soil microbes like different depths in the soil. Tillage mixes up the soil layers, causing microbes to have to reestablish re themselves at their preferred depths. For a 4 by 8 garden, you'll need the following. You'll need cardboard to cover the area, including a 3 to 6 inch overlap between the pieces. This is a great way to recycle those cardboard boxes you receive in the mail. You'll need enough compost or manure to cover the area 3 to 4 inches deep. You'll need straw, hay, leaves, or other mulch material to a depth of 6 to 12 inches. There is some controversy about using hay instead of straw because hay may contain more weed seeds. Well, theoretically, straw is just the stalks of a cereal grain like wheat without any weeds. But where I live, straw often contains seeds of the grain and weed seeds, especially organic straw. Hay is typically a combination of grasses that includes the seeds of the plant that make up the hay. Either hay or straw works well. Use whatever you have available in your area. First, if the grass is tall, either push it over or cut it short. You can leave the clippings on the ground. Don't bag them up. Cover the grass with one inch of compost. Next, cover the compost with cardboard, overlapping three to six inches, and then two to three inches of compost on top of the cardboard. Cover the compost with six to 12 inches of mulch. It will be really tall, but it will reduce down after a rain or two. And that's it. No tilling, just pile stuff on top of the lawn. It will suffocate the grass and enrich the soil. It's easier to use starts or seedlings rather than seeds in a garden like this. Once you have built the garden, you can actually plant in it immediately. To plant, pull the mulch aside, cut a hole in the cardboard big enough to fit your plant, and plant in that hole. Pull the mulch back around the plant and you're done. You'll want to water it well after you plant, but after that, check before you water. Chances are that the mulch and hay will keep enough moisture on the plants without watering. That's one of the benefits of this sort of gardening. Earthworms will eventually eat up the cardboard layer, tilling the soil for you as they do. The cardboard provides a barrier to weeds. If weeds do pop through, just smother them with mulch. Books of straw or hay are good for this. In the second year and subsequent year, just add 6 to 12 inches of mulch material to the top of the garden and plant right into it. You can use mulch gardening to compost your kitchen scraps simply by slipping them under the mulch layer. Ruth Stout popularized this method of gardening in a book called How to Have a Green Thumb Without an Aching Back. I love that title. She's used it for more than 30 years into her 90s on a large garden in Pennsylvania with no tilling, composting, fertilizing, watering, weeding, or poison sprays. The story is that she was inspired one spring while waiting for someone to come to till her garden. She noticed that the asparagus were doing just fine without the tilling. She wondered if the rest of her garden to do this, could do the same. It could. After that spring, she never tilled again and wrote a charming book about her method. Ruth Stout's approach is an excellent example of another principle of ecological design, learning by observing nature. Mulch gardening mimics the natural ecosystem of a forest floor. The forest, like the mulch garden, gets an annual layer of mulch that acts as a weed barrier, keeps in moisture, and does composting in place, adding nutrients that earthworms carry deep into the soil. Bill Mollison, developer of the permaculture system of ecological design, calls this process protracted and thoughtful observation rather than prolonged and thoughtless action. Conventional garden thinking often involves figuring out what more we can do in the garden to improve productivity. Stout and other no-till advocates like Masanobu Fukuoka take an approach to gardening that asks, what less can I do? For answers, these gardeners observe nature to see what additional garden tasks can be turned over to natural systems. It turns out that tilling is one of those tasks we can turn back to nature. I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. Start small with gardening, obtain a satisfying yield, and then build on your success. It's pretty hard to keep up enthusiasm for something unless you get a yield. If you've never gardened before, I suggest starting with a 4x4 or a 4x8 garden. Even a garden this small will yield something fresh for the table all summer long, and you can easily cover it with a simple greenhouse to extend the season into the fall and winter. So what should you start with? To obtain that satisfying yield, pick things that do well in your area and learn to like them. In my area, winters include greens like chard, kale, collards, lettuces except during the heat of the summer, 
potatoes, tomatoes, bush beans, herbs like parsley and basil, and eggplant. If you have trouble enjoying what grows best in your area, check out a few popular cookbooks and learn some new ways to prepare your garden yield. Often what we think we don't like is badly prepared. And remember, growing and eating fresh food is often an entirely different experience than eating preserved food or even produce shipped in and bought from the store. Once you've planted up a nice variety of plants that thrive in your area, how do you nurture them? Like Elliot Coleman, I take a plant-positive approach to insect and disease problems. Keep plants healthy with a vibrant soil food web, avoid monocultures, and rotate crops from year to year. These simple and sustainable practices go a long way toward minimizing problems. Pay attention to the amount of sunlight your plants get, and of course, make sure that they get the right amount of water. If you do get problems, then there are a number of organic remedies, many of which you can whip up in your kitchen. Water and soap will control aphids. A solution of water and garlic in a blender is good for a variety of plant problems. It's beyond the scope of this lecture to go into details on pests and disease, but many non-poisonous and natural solutions for specific problems can be prepared from herbs and other supplies in your kitchen. Here's an interesting tip from French gardeners. Build habitat for a wide variety of beneficial insects. I've seen these in gardens all over France. Your garden should include not only the plants you grow to eat, but also some plants that will attract insects for pest control and pollination. The herb dill, for example, will attract beneficial wasps, not harmful to people, but very helpful for controlling pests. You can dig a small pond and stock it with goldfish. If you don't feed them, they'll snack on mosquito larvae. The pond will also provide habitat for frogs and other amphibians that will patrol your garden for insects. Put up birdhouses and plant flowers to attract birds to your garden. They'll snack on insects as well as add beauty and song to your garden. Bats also help with controlling insect pests. Consider installing bat houses to attract bats to your garden. What if your space is limited but you want to start eating homegrown food? Here are some strategies for growing food in a small space. If access to a garden plot is limited, you can start growing in containers. You can grow a wide range of vegetables and fruits in containers. Here's a crop I grew in a container that required no planting, no fertilizing, and no watering. It's lamb's quarters, also known as chenopodium. It's a common weed. You can use it in cooked dishes in the same way you would use spinach, and it makes an excellent pesto. I originally planted a blueberry in this container, but rabbits ate the plant before I got around to protecting it. In the spring, the container was full of lamb's quarter. There must have been lamb's quarter seed in the compost I used in making the soil mix. I've had dozens of meals from this container of lamb's quarters. My colleague, Dr. Tim Amaya, who developed the organic standards for the country of Bhutan, says the goal of sustainable agriculture is to turn plants into weeds. In other words, food plants should be so healthy and robust that they grow like weeds with little extra care from us. Make a soilless mix. The soil in, a container, in containers can get easily compacted, so it's important to have a loose, well-drained mix. I use 50% peat moss or coconut coir, at least 25% compost, we'll learn more about making compost later, and 25% vermiculite or perlite. Perlite is expanded lightweight rock that keeps the mix well drained. Depending on the requirements of the plant, you can add lime, rock powders, and an organic fertilizer. In most cases, it's better not to use soil. Water properly. A common cause of failure in container gardening is overwatering. Use automatic watering systems when possible. Get creative with the use of containers. The lamb's quarter was grown in a container I made from a recycled plastic barrel. The figs are in containers I got used from a nursery, four for three dollars. You can recycle lots of things to use as plant containers. Grow kitchen herbs that are especially good fresh, like basil and parsley. Rosemary is another herb that works well in a container. Keep them close so that you can grab a handful and toss them into your cooking. Use containers to grow fruits that won't grow outside. I love fresh figs, but they are not cold hardy in Iowa. I have friends that get two crops a year from their potted figs. Here's a picture of figs for sale at the Jean Talon Market in Montreal, probably the best farmer's market in North America. These figs are far outside the normal range for growing figs. I've bought Iowa-grown grapefruit and bananas at my local farmer's market from someone who grows them in containers outside in the summer and brings them in in the winter. Did you know that Louis XIV grew citrus in containers in Paris, which is further north than any place in the U.S.? 
These citrus trees are in a public park in Paris. Imagine my surprise when I discovered these papayas growing in pots as street plants in Des Moines, Iowa. Where can you find papaya seed? Well, you can buy a papaya at the supermarket, eat the fruit, and plant the seeds. I'd like to take a minute and talk just a little more about seeds. The modern food system is an illusion of choice. There are 35,000 products in your supermarket, but most of them are made from just four plants, corn, wheat, rice, and soybeans. But our human cultural heritage is more than 35,000 edible and useful plants. Our ancestors have been selectively developing and breeding these plants since before the dawn of settled agriculture 10,000 years ago. This is an irreplaceable heritage that we share with all humans on the planet. Getting involved in growing some of your food or developing relationships with farmers connects you to this heritage. As seed companies have consolidated in the global marketplace, the seeds of many varieties of food plants are no longer available in the marketplace. You can help preserve our cultural heritage of a wide diversity of food plants by getting involved with a seed saving organization. Seed Savers Exchange has 15,000 amateur gardener members that are dedicated to maintaining the wide diversity of cultivated food plants. For example, some members grow hundreds of varieties of tomatoes every year and save the seeds. Seed Savers maintains a collection of 700 different varieties of apples in their heritage orchard in Decorah, Iowa. I often bring students to their annual gathering every summer, which brings hundreds of eccentric little old men and women who, again, save hundreds of varieties of tomatoes or potatoes or squashes every year and are just really passionate about it. And it's great to see young people get engaged with these older, older folks and uh, pass this, this heritage along. But being a member of Seed Savers Exchange allows you to access thousands of unusual varieties of food plants that are available nowhere else. Getting involved in saving seeds and using heirloom vegetable varieties in your garden adds interest to your garden and a wider variety of flavors to your table. But there is another reason to get involved in maintaining a wide diversity of food plants. Have you ever heard of the Irish potato famine? One of the reasons it was so devastating is that everyone was using the same variety of potato, which lacked resistance to a blight that wiped out the crop in the entire country. We don't know which unusual variety of tomato, for example, might contain a gene that gives traits that may be essential in the future. For example, resistance to drought or disease. Having a wider variety of food plants makes our food system more resilient to the wide range of challenges that may come our way in the future, whether from climate change, disease, or other problems we can't foresee. Lettuce is a great example of a plant family with a wide diversity. There is a surprisingly beautiful range of colors in the lettuce family, ranging from neon green to deep wine red. Buy a selection of colors and plant them in a pot. Neon light Swiss chard is another beautiful plant to use in an edible landscape mix. Edible landscaping can compete for beauty with ornamental gardens and has the added benefit of providing something for the table. No place to put containers? Many cities have community garden space where you can rent a small plot for a nominal fee. Kansas City has a program that gets you a plot, organic fertilizer, water, seeds, plants, and support for $10 per year. Look for similar programs in your city or band together with friends and neighbors on a vacant lot. Can't have a garden or don't want to? Well, even if you live in the city, you can add richness to your life through joining a community-supported agriculture, CSA, or shopping at the farmer's market. In community-supported agriculture, you pay a subscription fee to a farmer in exchange for a weekly box of whatever is fresh and ripe. It's a partnership with a farmer where you share in the bounty of a good year and soften the loss of a bad year. And here's something you probably have never thought of. You can add agritourism to your vacation and travel schedule. Popular in rural Italy and France, it's catching on in the US. Visiting a small food producer or farmer add rich, adds richness to your vacation and travel plans. Some farms and producers provide a short tour and sampling of the wares, and others provide lodging and meals straight from the farm. My favorites are wineries, cheesemakers, field-to-table restaurants, and small vegetable producers. 
You can get ideas on who to visit by asking questions at the farmer's market. Many cities are creating new ordinances that allow small livestock like bees and chickens in urban areas. Bees help with pollination as well as provide honey. If you discover that you like growing food and are good at it, you may want to consider growing extra for sale at the market or even becoming a full-time farmer. Every year, my neighbors, who have a large 40 by 40 by 50 foot home garden, grow a little extra butternut squash to sell. This year, they had a bumper crop and sold 400 pounds of surplus squash to a local grocer, which paid for their garden supplies for several years. Jean Martin Fortier is a great example of the new breed of successful full-time organic farmers. His one and a half acre farm in southern Quebec grosses $160,000 and he and his family net about 40% of that. Check out his excellent book, The Market Gardener. We often think that large farms are what feed the world, but Vandana Shiva points out that traditional small farmers feed 70% of the world. We can use modern knowledge of organic farming to boost the productivities of these small farms so they can feed even more people. Maybe, maybe you will become one of the millions of new small farmers needed in the U.S. to meet the growing demand for local food. In this lecture, we've explored a wide variety of options for becoming more involved with your food as it travels from seed to fork. Food is always better when it's fresh, and the best stuff is grown at home. Sourcing food locally reduces the ecological costs of transporting food. An Iowa State University study found that the average bite of food travels 1,500 miles from farm to fork. The benefits of being involved in local sustainable food production are a clear example of how sustainability is about a better quality of life, not just minimizing ecological impact. I invite you to use the strategies that I've outlined in this lecture to get started with your own sustainable food revolution. In addition, you will learn more about sustainability and the potential for abundance by working with nature from having your own garden than from any other activity that I can think of.